Jennifer Goodman from the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. It's great having you as participants on our first wave of virtual gatherings. Um, we did it in response to a, a little survey that some of you filled out about what were the most critical issues you wanted to talk about in this unusual time. Um, I think you all know us, the Statewide Historic Preservation Group. Um, during these challenging, challenging times, we're continuing our old ways of working as well as new ways of working. Um, just really want to help people involved in community projects, old house and barn work, um, advocating on the front lines. Um, uh -oh. This is a gathering about fundraising and communication, and you can rate my job doing fundraising and communication as I go. <laughs> I just um, wanted to thank people who are members of the organization and encourage you to support the Preservation Alliance if you're not already. Um, that core funding helps us um, help people help more projects like you're working on, help expand the toolkit so that we can all encourage more historic preservation investment um, in your communities and around the state. And I think you know that uh, we're open for business in these weird times and um, again, wanting to provide assistance in old ways and new ways to help get more preservation work done. A little support makes a big difference. Um, you guys, today's group is a great one. Um, uh, I won't, in, some of you have already introduced yourself, um, and I'm not going to go through that right now and spend the time doing that, but when you ask questions later, be sure to introduce yourself. Um, I looked at the list and I would characterize the group as um, about three quarters of you are, are involved in, actively involved in capital projects, bricks and mortar, community preservation projects. Some of you are just getting started. Some of you are almost done, some in the middle. Um, if I surveyed you, I think some of you would say you're novices and some of you have quite a resume of um, successful fundraising and communication work over time. Um, I think about half of you all also have operating needs, um, trying to raise money from membership, annual funds, businesses, special events to keep things going on a week to week and year to year basis. Um, so that's sort of some setup. Um, I think some of you noticed that George Bourne is with us today, who's our historic resource guy at LCHIP, which is fabulous, Land and Community Heritage Investment Program. Um, we teed him up to um, say a little bit at the end of this session, but certainly George, um, jump in before then if there's things you wanna say. You can do a little advertisement about your <laughs> Your new deadlines, and I know a lot of you um, are successful LCHIP applicants um, from over time. Um, and I am recording this. We are recording this, this and the other virtual gatherings we're doing to try to make this information more readily available to a bigger group um, beyond you. Um, so it's um, it's great to have Betsy McNamara with us as well. George and George is here, and Betsy McNamara. Um, I know some of you have worked with her before in her consulting group called Full Circle Consulting. Um, Betsy's helped raise tens of millions of dollars um, across New Hampshire and beyond, a lot of it associated with special places. Um, I know we first got to know her at the Preservation Alliance when she was raising money for Diamond Hill Farm and Concord, an effort to, to rescue that farm and um, steward it into the future. She's done a lot of other great uh, preservation and conservation projects as well. Um, help the Preservation Alliance do a really effective um, campaign feasibility study for Barnes a few years ago. She's also been an excellent um, presenter and advisor for us at conferences and for many of our constituents. So thanks for joining us, Betsy. <laughs> um, and I'll just say my last bit of um, setup is just to say the goal of this is really um, to try to answer questions, um, offer you some context and direction during these unusual times. I know for me, just having a chance to talk about fundraising and communication and um, get down a, a, a bit of a plan that I know will need to continue to be updated is really helping me feel less uncertain in uncertain times. So the goal of this session is really to, um, hopefully you'll leave with some questions answered and um, feeling like uh, more for your plan than maybe you already have and um, hopefully a, a sense of practicality as well as optimism about 
what's ahead. So we were going to let um, Betsy kind of kick it off for 10 or 15 minutes of some really important kind of context for all of this. And then we'll try to, I think, chunk it out a little bit to let you answer uh, different questions. We also really welcome um, descriptions of what you think is already working for you um, over the last couple of weeks or what you have planned going forward that you think would be important to share. So I'll stop talking and pitch it over to Betsy. All right. Thank you. So I have to say, this is my first presentation on Zoom. I've been in Zoom meetings a lot, um, but my first presentation, so I'm going to see, you guys can give me feedback. I tried to make it fun. So um, the question right now, I think, for all nonprofits is, do I fundraise in, during a pandemic? It feels kind of weird. It feels kind of awkward. Um, so what I thought we would do to answer that, or, and if I do fundraise, how do I do it? in a way that resonates and is relevant to the time. So I thought what I would do is take a step backward and look at some of the fundamentals of fundraising because uh, I think it will ground us in, um, as we work together to answer that question. Because um, some things are definitely different right now, but there are a lot of things that are the same as we have, as we have always pursued fundraising. So to take a step back, Thinking about who gives. Some of you have been in my presentations before. This is usually where I show a pie chart that's hard to read. But what is surprising, I think, to a lot of people is that in terms of philanthropic giving in the United States, the vast majority of money comes from individuals or decisions are made by individuals. The estimates are it's 82 to 85 percent of every of all charitable dollars come from individuals. And that's broken out into people may, writing a check or making a gift or making a gift or a transfer of stock now, people um, uh, leaving a bequest, so making estate plans, so that's about 8% of gifts, but that was an individual making that decision. And another six to 8% is individuals who've set up a donor advised fund through a foundation. And so it, the money might come from say the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation or Fidelity, but it's actually an individual behind that decision. So between those three, donor advice funds, estate planning or bequests, and uh, a live person giving money out of their own um, uh, capacity right now, 82 to 85 percent of all philanthropic gifts come from individuals. So I say that because a lot of times nonprofits I work with um, really want to focus on foundations and grants. And um, often that can be very, very effective, but it, 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 is, it is not where the, all the money is. Um, it helps you decide where to spend your time. So New Hampshire has relatively few foundations, unlike Boston or New York City, or even some other uh, metropolitan areas that might have major um, company foundations or um, large community foundations funded by individuals. So we, we just don't have the, the, the breadth of foundations that other communities have. Um, so it's even more important, I think, that you focus your philanthropic energy and time on uh, connecting with individuals. And then another fact about fundraising is that um, most of the money given to your nonprofit is going to come from a handful of people. And so when I first started fundraising 30 years ago, it was the rule was 80-20. 80% of your funds is going to come from 20% of your donors. And these days, the rule is 90-10, and some even think it's 95-5. Mm. So you have, we're in a situation that <clears throat> it's very likely that if you're an existing organization, you already have a handful of donors who are very important to you, and they're probably individuals. And if you're a startup that's doing um, a capital campaign, it's always true with capital campaigns that a handful of people are going to make or break your campaign. 10 to 12 people are going to bring in 70% of the money. So um, keeping that in mind, then, I think it is important to take a moment to reflect on why people give. What motivates a donor to give? Okay, so here's where I'm going to get a little weird. So the first one is, for those of you on the phone, I'm, I'm saying the first, the number one reason why people give is because they were asked. So this is relevant to these times. It's very, very rare 
to have somebody make a gift without actually being solicited, without actually being asked. You know, you do hear of GoFundMe campaigns or Red Cross or something, but those are pretty rare. It's especially for historic preservation or land conservation, which are the kind of projects that I have worked on that Jennifer referenced, you really have to go out and ask and you have to get people to invest. The second reason people give is because they were asked by someone they know and respect. Essentially, they were asked by somebody that they have a hard time saying no to. So it's, um, it's really important to um, uh, make sure that you know when you're talking to people that the person you're talking to, it's not a cold call, it's really somebody in the community and somebody else in the community is asking that person. The third reason people give, main reason, is because they have a personal commitment to the cause or the organization. And so this is, this, I, I sort of call this the Bill Gates effect. You know, Bill Gates has a lot of money. And I, I have actually had people say to me, well, Bill Gates has a lot of money. Let's reach out to him. And the answer is, well, no, he has, yes, he has a lot of money, but no, he's not gonna give because he has not yet <laughs> demonstrated or shown in any capacity that he has interest in a small social service agency in central New Hampshire, for example. So um, you have to make sure that the person has a personal commitment to the cause or to the organization. The fourth top reason why people give is because they can see the impact of their gift. Have you ever had the feeling where you made a $50 gift or even a $500 gift or something that feels like a big gift for you? And then you wonder, whatever happened to that? You know, did I even make a dent in the need or did I, was there any outcome from that? That's the kind of thing that it's really important to demonstrate for all nonprofits, especially at this time. And then that leads into the last top reason why donors give. They feel appreciated. I hope you can see the little heart in the corner there. You can see the heart. Um, <laughs> they feel appreciated. So that goes part and parcel. You know, I've had, I, I, I do this training a lot and I've had donors say, or folks say, um, you know, I gave a gift and I was really excited about this cause and I never heard from them. You know, so I don't, they don't know I'm alive. Why would I give them again, give to them again? Um, so showing appreciation, showing that you notice that they've given, showing that if they haven't renewed their gift that you notice, that's not pounding, that is um, noticing and following up and appreciating. So with those things in mind, um, it just feels like there's a conclusion that is in normal times, it is very likely that a small number of individual donors who have been asked, who care deeply about your organization and are excited to see the impact um, will be the linchpin to your success in fundraising. Does that make sense? So keeping those kind of donors in mind, let's discuss, I wanna, I wanna talk now about what's the same and what's different about fundraising in the time of COVID-19. What's the same, I would argue almost everything. You still have to ask in order for donors to give. <laughs> you still want it to be personal and connect it to them and hopefully have it be by somebody who, who, who they respect. You still want to talk about the impact of your work now more than ever, I think. And you still want to connect with, to the, uh, oh, did I do that wrong? Impact, connect to the personal right. work and they still want to appreciate, you still want to appreciate your donors. And, support them. and so when we talk about, um, reaching out now, I think what is different, there are clearly a few things that are different. One is tone. I think you, you have to acknowledge what's going on in the world um, and place yourself squarely in the type of organization. I mean, I just keep repeating to people, I think the work you guys are doing is good news. And we, everybody really wants good news right now. So if you are sharing about your impact, if you're sharing about your plans that may have had to be adjusted because of the pandemic, 
this is all good news. You're communicating with your donors and telling them that you care about them and that you know they're interested and so you want to be respectful of that and fill them in. Um, you, the, the a second thing that's different right now is that it is a reality that especially foundations and perhaps many donors are going to change the focus of their grant making to um, crisis response. And frankly, as they should, right? Our communities are really hurting. So you're gonna see that for a while. You saw that in the 2007, 2008 crisis, the foundations really turned to basic needs. And so for arts and culture and humanities groups, that makes it a little tougher and makes it all the more important that we focus on the individuals who really care about our projects. Um, the third thing is timing. Um, it's, if you're in a capital campaign, it's, it's really difficult to ask somebody for a lead gift to a campaign, especially if they're not an existing donor, especially if you're starting up as an organization. It's really hard to do that by phone or by Zoom. It really does make sense to do it in person. So um, I suggest that you keep in touch with those prospective donors and um, let them know that you'll be in touch again to set up a meeting when we get the all clear. So other than those three things, I think things are pretty much the same. What you can be doing that's extra right now, and I think what's the best thing you can do right now, is really communicate very heavily with your donors and not necessarily asking for money and your prospective donors. So folks that you might have been talking to about, about participating in a campaign. Um, and if it's a broader based effort, sending a mailing or an email blast, just keep keeping them up to date, keeping them apprised as to how this has happened or how this has impacted your organization. So if your plan is to still continue 100% with the campaign as initially, um, can, uh, as the initial idea was, let them know that. If you've had to revise your plan in some way, either make it the, the scope of it smaller or extend the timeline, let them know that. Transparency, I think, is really important right now. We're all in the same boat. Um, and everybody knows these are difficult times, but what you do want to do is keep your organization at top of mind. Because as I said, I think it's good news for a lot of people. Um, and toward the end here, we're going to brainstorm about messaging specific to historic preservation. Um, so your work is good news to a lot of people. Once we emerge from this, they really want to see these projects complete because they know it's good for their society or their, your communities. And they will appreciate the, the time and attention you have uh, directed their way, showing them that you, you value them and you value their, their insight and you want them to stay involved. Um, the worst thing you can do right now is go dark, not communicate, not ask. Um, just, you know, I think a tendency is to think, well, everybody's worried about something much more important right now and they are but they also want to be thinking about you guys and especially if you can talk about what the project is going to do for the community and really message the historic preservation part of it and keep them in the loop i think that will be helpful otherwise they're going to assume that it it has stopped and and won't go forward and you don't want people to jump to that assumption excuse me so that you, is um can you hear me what was that? I'm Diane Martin, uh, Save Our Gale School, Belmont, New Hampshire, and I'm the chairman. Do you think newspaper articles and things like that would be a good avenue to let people know what's going on? I think it can be. Um, it depends, I think, how you typically communicate with your community. So if that's the typical way, I would say, uh, sorry, where are you from? Belmont? Belmont. Um, do you have a community-based newspaper right now? Um, we don't. We have some local, you know, the town puts out a newsletter and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I just worry that a, um, we're a, having this conversation right now. I'm managing a capital campaign in Nashua for a, an arts group, and we're having that exact same conversation. And our decision was, no, don't put it in the paper because everybody, all the coverage is focused on the economy and the pandemic. So we, we sent out an email blast, a more okay. direct. But if you're, right. 
if your uh, community is used to getting their news through a town newsletter or something like that, then I think it would be fine. Yeah, okay. So we have like a, a local free newspaper. Um, yeah, you know, if it's... And they if it's that up. Yep. I'm sure they're looking okay. for content. Uh, um, great point. They are looking for content and making it easy for really strapped um, newspapers and other media and communications groups get a great press release to them, make it really easy. Yeah, so I, I appreciated your point about the, uh, wh what are the tools that have worked over time? What's your norm? What's the culture of your local media and papers, which might be different in Nashua than they are in um, right. Belmont Lakes region. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I like the analogy you offered when we prepped for this about cleaning out your closets. Like a lot of people are cleaning closets that they haven't before. And I'm sure there's communication plans that you sort of haven't ever gotten around to, but knew you should always be doing. And I think there's your ideas, um, what you were just suggesting, I think kind of relates to that, Betsy, of make sure you're doing the, the touch, nice touch to major donors and um, are being as effective as possible in that engagement. Yeah. We use thank you cards a lot and people love them. That's great. <laughs> they love to be thanked for what they, they've done, you know. Let's, yeah, let's, don't ask, all. let's ask some questions, kind of just backing up to the major points that um, Betsy made. Does anybody have any questions about the who, who's giving now, who used to, who's given over time? Um, no? Betsy, I have a question, actually. This is Phil Franklin from hey, Bartlett Phil. Historical Society. Where, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Franklin, Bartlett Historical Society. Uh, we're working on a project to uh, renovate um, and reopen uh, the first Catholic church that was here in the Mount Washington Valley as our uh, Historical Society Museum. Um, this kind of caught us in the middle of, of uh, fundraising and at the uh, early part of uh, construction, which has kind of come to a, or reconstruction, I guess you'd say, which has kind of come to a halt right now. Anyway, one of the things that um, I've noticed is that um, all of our, we were getting uh, small donations from individuals, mostly. Um, I've gotten turned down by a couple of uh, foundations for just the reason that you just said, is that they've changed their focus to human needs and COVID-19 and that was it. They encouraged me to come back at a later point in time. Nice. Um, which was good. So, but the, the, the individual donations that we were getting um, have just seemingly dried up at this point in time. One of the things that I was thinking about doing at this stage was to contact and get in contact with um, some people to form an advisory group um, that would be uh, some people who have given, all of them have to have given, let's put it that way, um, to one degree or another. I don't care if it's $25 or it's $10,000. Right. They've got to have a stake in the game. But I'm wondering what your thoughts would be around doing that and timing and that sort of thing um, for, for getting this group together. Well, I just wonder what the purpose is. What's the purpose so, of the advisory group? The purpose of the advisory group would be a couple of fold. First of all, just because I want to keep these folks who I would consider to be key folks um, in in the community um, aware that we're we're not giving up. This project is going to go forward. It may take us another year, but it's going to go forward. Secondly, um, I'd be asking them to um, uh, consider offering different ways that they might see for fundraising, but also to um, uh, open doors for us. So as you mentioned before, um, you know, there are people who are, would be willing to talk with me, I'm hoping, but they don't know me. Yeah. So I was, I would like to use them as a springboard to, um, to go to another individual who, you know, they think might be willing to contribute and introduce the project and me and then I can I can go and do my pitch and answer questions. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great thing to do. And this in this lull time right now in your campaign, um, okay. it seems like a really good time to um, recruit some folks. 
as long as they have a clear, you know, understanding of what their purpose is and what the time commitment is, I think, and that would be incumbent on you. Yep. As, in terms of the lull and the, and the small gifts drying up, I would say that, um, yes, you can go out and ask right now. I suggest you do a, if you're going to do a mailing, for example, if you're with a, a nonprofit that goes year round already and is thinking, well, this is our spring appeal time. I might do a, some sort of warm up piece first, just letting, that's not fundraising, just letting them know that you're still, you know, here's what, how we've reacted. And again, that could be email, mm -hmm. but um, gifts will come back. I think what's, what's hurting giving right now is the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, none of us knows, I say, you know, gifts will come back. What will happen is when people have a stronger sense of where their job is, where their business is, um, what the economy is going to look like, then they'll feel more confident of giving. Now there are people, as Jennifer pointed out in our conversation a days ago, there are some businesses that are booming right now. So mm -hmm. some people are doing better than usual. So you can't assume that everybody's in trouble, but it is the, un in general, it is uncertainty that um, is tough for fundraising. Right. Um, and I experienced that personally in 2007, 2008. I mean, fundraisers started noticing that, um, I mean, I wasn't paying attention to the economy, but I was noticing that donors were saying, not right now, I need to hold off right now. Um, and then once things sort of stabilized, people who had money before, they have less of it, but they still have money. <laughs> you know, once they understand that, um, okay, this is the new normal and we're gonna, um, we're gonna resume giving. Okay. So from an economic perspective then, we, in, this caught us where we had just put out a supplement and I would have normally have, if, if we had known, you know, the crystal ball was there, I would have put the supplement out now as opposed to before and said, here's what we're doing. But that, that's already past the dam. But um, uh, just so in our last newsletter, which just went out at the beginning of this month, we said that, we were, you know, we would certainly continue to welcome gifts, but we were trying to be sensitive to economic and human conditions and basically said, you know, we'll please don't worry about us right now, worry about you. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we should have uh, done it a little differently. Yeah, I think, I think I'd rather focus on a message of, um, we're still here. Here's why we still need support. And, um, okay. you know, we, I, I, I was listening to the radio a couple of weeks ago and a really, and this is different because it's an immediate needs. It's what, it's a food bank in, um, North shore of Massachusetts. And it, I thought it was a really fantastic ad to, cause basically it talked about if you're personally impacted by this pandemic, we're here for you. And if, if you're doing fine, please consider supporting us. So if you can somehow turn that into historic preservation language, like we're going to be here for you after this is over, you know, a beautiful place to visit. If you have land or something, trails to walk on, a place of, what did you call it, Jennifer? Solace and respite in our, in our communities. Um, we'll still be here doing that for you. And so I hope that you'll consider supporting us. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate the, um, the intention behind that, mm. but you, but one thing that it's, it's, um, you don't want to assume is that nobody has any money because a lot of people still have a lot of money. Do you want to talk for a few more minutes about words and messages you just mentioned? Yeah, that would be great. I think, yeah. you know, you guys are in this field specifically, Jennifer used those really wonderful words of historic preservation as solace and respite. I talked with a um, community-based farm that has all kinds of land and conservation, and we talked about how she could they could promote their trail system as a play a way to manage you know your social isolate your be outside while still being safely uh, separated. Community, so. longevity, anchors, those are words other people have used, you know, in, in, for the, the positivity part of ours. There's also obviously the huge jobs and economy part of historic preservation, shovel ready, stimulus, 
economic vitality. Um, again, being respectful of the individual situations of who, whomever you're talking to, but um, you know, either that we're helping support local businesses right now and that we're ready, kind of shovel ready, helping projects um, take off um, when things get, when things shift again, get back to normal, whatever the right language is. Yeah, I think messages of positivity and strength. I mean, one of the things of business and fundraising is that success yields success. So if you start talking about how much in trouble we are, you can, well, two things, you can only do that for a short period of time because otherwise you, people get worn out and it's crying wolf. But if you really are in trouble and need an infusion of something, I would try and keep that as small as possible and talk to your most loyal donors. Because um, of the positivity factor. Yeah, because you want to be positive. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, you want to be positive, um, especially in a time right now. What positive news is really welcome, and your organizations have a lot to offer. So they, so one organization that I've admired how they've they've changed is the New Hampshire Humanities. You know, their whole thing is small gatherings. They do over th more than one event a day per per more than three three and sixty five events a year, and. Um, and now suddenly they can't do those. So they've pivoted, the new word, right, to um, an online newsletter of humanities and culture and um, online presentations, live, you know, sort of Facebook live type presentation. And so they're still talking about their relevance. They're still talking about the importance, especially in these times. You know, we all need good news and think, interesting things to think about that are not pandemic and depression, economic depression. And um, so, so whatever you can offer in that realm, I, I, is it somebody here from the American Independence Museum? Thought I saw yes. somebody on that list. Hmm? Yes, I am. Okay. This is Emma from the Independence Museum. Okay. I still lost where you were, who you were. So Emma, sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Okay. So, you know, you might um, be thinking about stories that you can email out about exhibits that you have that might entice people to say, you know, I haven't been there in a while. I'd like to come back. Absolutely. Just, yeah. Are you, are you doing stuff like that? We are. Well, right now we're focused on educational content. So yeah. building out resources for parents that are now teachers at home um, and teachers as well. So that's where we're really finding uh, the sweet spot for now, but our curator is working on building out resources more related to the collection as well. Um, so we'll be launching that out soon. But yeah, that was a complete change of direction for us. Um, but trying to bring in that kind of our, our mantra has been sharing history. So even though we're closed, we're still sharing history. Beautiful. That's great. So I, think I would say make it easy and fun. Like don't Right, people shouldn't pivot to a fact to something that they're it takes a lot of startup, takes a lot of money, takes a That's lot of true. worry. Mm -hmm. You know, figure out what fits the culture of what you're doing anyways and is feels fun and easy to pull off. I, I think your constituents. There's that and there's off. also, I mean, the single most effective way to communicate with your donors is to pick up the phone and have a conversation. And it is simply just wanted to fill you in on what we're doing and that you know, Phil, for example, in the your case of your campaign, our campaign has had to stop for now. We can't meet face to face, you know, with economic uncertainty, we are finding that donors are saying not right now. So we're just gonna pause, but we'll resume. And we, ex we will succeed, as you said. So very similar message. And if you're an existing historical society, I think I saw a few of those on here, and you have like a membership um, new mailing that needs to go out soon, um, if you can touch those folks prior to asking them to renew their membership, although, you know, I'm learning too. Um, Red River Theaters here in Concord, Jennifer, just, um, they're closed during their membership drive, which accounts for 45% of their annual operating budget. So um, they just send out an appeal individually to members saying, please don't forget to renew. And if you could renew early, that would really help us. So we did. Yeah. So, so and it would help us because, what? I'm sorry, I cut you off, Lucy. I'm sorry. Well, and it would help us because we're not open to get the income, you know, the ticket revenue right now. Okay. So just very, so that's a C, I can see the impact. 
I'm helping them sustain through this tough time because I really value that institution in my community, that organization. Okay, so we're, we're at the process of, of wrapping up a membership drive um, that was, we, we do it based on fiscal year. So it was from January through usually the end of March. Yep. We, have a, we have a number of people who I would normally have renewed, I think, but haven't. So a well-worded letter with, uh, a, like, we miss you, we haven't seen you <laughs> uh, type thing uh, would go well that it was for what you're saying. Yeah, okay. I would. Acknowledging, okay. again, acknowledging the pandemic. Okay. Acknowledging okay. that just simply, these are tough times we know. And we hope you'll consider in these tough times renewing your membership with the Bartlett Historical Society. And mm -hmm. here's why it's even more important this year. Right. Okay. Thank you. Althea, did I see? There she is. Uh, yeah, Althea Barton from Kimball Jenkins. Hi. Um, hi. hi Hi, thanks so much for this. It's really, really great. Um, I've been thinking a lot about our messaging and our situation is that uh, we have an LCHIP grant, we have funding just about lined up for um, a $400,000 project to restore our roof. Yay. Um, yay is right. It's um, pretty amazing because a lot of people have put a lot of hard work into it, as you can imagine, over a long period of time. So uh, we're really psyched and we actually had our launch party pretty much on the day when they started saying people shouldn't be meeting anymore, which was a little awkward, but um, we made it through and then suddenly we were kind of faced with, you know, do we keep going? Because we still do need some funds and we wanted to really beef up the education piece um, and just get the word out for um, public support. Um, so we had a li little bit of a lull, but I've been thinking a lot about um, how to make it um, not a story about the roof, but a story about the people involved. Um, of course, there's under the roof, what happens in the place and under the roof, and that um, is a story that's sort of um, um, well known to the people, to our supporters and the people who come in. But there's also the story of the people who would be doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we would be pumping $400,000 into the economy. Uh, most of that goes to labor because it's a restoration. There's, you know, it's a few Yay. sheets of copper is all they have to buy, but everything else is labor. So, um, and it's, you know, 10 or 15 um, craftspeople who will be up there. Um, um, it's a little bit tricky because every day things change in terms of how many feet apart you have to be and how people should stay safe and OSHA guidelines. Um, and we want to make sure that we're conveying it in a way that if we are able to start the work soon, which we hope we can, um, that we're making sure that everybody's safe and that no one is thinking of donating but worrying that we're putting people at risk which we would never want to do so it, it is it is tricky because the thing changes day by day um, but we're trying to strike strike that balance so i think that is a really really great approach of talking about the crafts people and the economy and the other thing is that it's such good news that you're you have you you know you're at the very end of your campaign right or of your fundraising effort that, right. wow, what better news is there? Like we, we are almost there and now we're gonna be able to start and make this investment in the community. And you have such a, vi my, uh, I'm in the Concord Center in Concord, so I'm like four blocks uh, or two blocks from you. The Kimball Jenkins estate is, for anybody who comes to Concord regularly, is just so, so well known and visibly, and so visible. So you have that too. For you, that might be a good newspaper story too. I would think the monitor would eat that up once you've communicated with your, because um, it'll be a very visible thing. They might want to take a photo or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's exciting. I, I really like your approach. Oh, well, thank you, yeah. And you could, at the end, you know, for your mail, if you're doing mail or a phone or something, you could say, and we're, we're X number of dollars away and that's for education, right? Right. Yeah. And that we're monitoring this every day in this rapidly changing yeah. world. I mean, to the, yeah, to your concern about that, you, you have a process in place and the right kind of people thinking about it every day and acting. So there, right. there, there's your, 
thing to communicate as being really important. Yeah. Because it right. is it's hard that it's changing every day. It is. It's really hard. Yeah. But you know, the, the funny thing is that, um, I mean, we had to close down all our other events. There's nobody taking classes. There's nobody taking tours. So yeah. it's ironic, but it, this will be the thing that's happening yep. on site. Yep. So, and it's it, a lot. It, it's a lot. Know, great stories. How about um, Haverhill, Swansea, Amherst, Epsom, Gilmanton? Anybody have any questions? We have about um, 20 more minutes, and we know we want to leave some time for a little bit for time for George at the end. I'm just here to absorb information, pretty much. <laughs> it's very helpful yeah. to me. Too. Yeah, this is Will Lute from uh, Amherst. I'm the uh, chair of our uh, Heritage Town Heritage Commission, and also I am the uh, chair of our board for the. Uh, Freedom's Way National Heritage Area, which encompasses uh, uh, 45 towns, 37 of which are in Massachusetts, and eight are which in uh, New Hampshire. Wow. And, on, and unfortunately, our big fundraising and our uh, big effort uh, that we do annually is what we call uh, Hidden Treasures, and that was supposed to go out in May. We make the uh, Hidden Treasures a, a, an entire month of May where the towns that are in the footprint of Freedom's Way, you know, that they spotlight some of the things that you may not know that are around. So it's put a really put a, a, a cramp on uh, getting visibility out there, maybe doing a little fundraising. So I'm just trying to under, uh, trying to figure out what's the best way that we can, you know, move forward in this time. And, you know, what I'm hearing is some really, you know, sort of good ideas uh, of, uh, you know, attack, not attacking the donors, but uh, contacting the donors in a, um, you know, not in, uh, you know, the first letter or email goes out, you just want to say that you want to keep in touch, not, you know, ask for dollars at the time, but then, you know, still keep in contact still you know press forward in trying to um, actually meet your goal of trying to get you know some funds for some of our projects but um, right now we're sort of in a hold mode right now uh, we're, we're still doing some some video production we're still uh, doing some zoom things but all in all it's um it's it's pretty slow and it's really it's unfortunate that it had to happen in may and we were highlighting, uh, you know, women that made a difference in the town since this is the 100th anniversary of the 19th mm -hmm. Amendment. So that's sort of, you know. Could you make it a driving tour? Uh, we thought about that. Uh, we're in the hikes. There's are just a plethora of nice trails and hikes. Ah. And we were going to do something um, along that line. At least in Amherst, we were going to have a... Uh, uh, a, a trail hike uh, from one of our spots to a uh, um, one of our uh, icons in the town, uh -huh. which is a uh, agricultural uh, corn crib, and we were going to have a model of a suffragette that is in you know what's hidden in this treasure. We were going to have a model of a suffragette with the you know votes for women thing. But uh, we don't know if we're going to do that now, so it's it's really tough, and I'm just here to learn and see what we can do to manage in this environment. Yeah, I think organizations that have had to cancel make key fundraising events yeah. that is really tough, and it, you have to you either have to push it, push it off to the fall, or in which case we'll all be busy every single night in the fall, right. or um, just cancel it outright. And I mean the Preservation Alliance experience this with canceling your biannual um absolutely oh, yeah. conference um so in that sense i wonder if you could reach out i was thinking doing a mailing but in some way reach out to some of your key donors and say this is our reality you know we we usually get x percent of our annual operating income from this event mm -hmm. we can't do it it's gonna you know um if we can't make up that money somehow, we hope you'll you'll give a little extra this year, kind of yeah. thing. I also like the idea of uh, 
of um, tying it to, uh, you know, I'm in the stone walls too, which is uh, interesting because I, I like the idea of attaching people to like, I always use the example, you know, these stone walls that are out in New Hampshire, somebody had to build those. Some poor sap that was on a farm that had 10 kids or eight kids had to get everybody there to do this. And these were lives lived. And yeah, I like yeah. the idea of attaching a project or an idea to people in the past or present that are trying to make a difference. You know, they were just in their survival mode back in the 18th, 19th century, but but they were people, they were lies lived, they're in our graveyards. Right. And it's yeah. good to treasure yeah. those, um, uh, those people. But I like that idea of a project and you tie it to people. And I think it personalizes it a little bit yeah. better. Hmm. Anybody else? Thanks for that, Will. Oh, I know thanks, that Jennifer. with the expo, when we had to postpone our expo uh, 10 days before it happened, Beverly Thomas, my colleague who's here, even though her name says Jennifer Goodman, like my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, I mean, and to Betsy's themes, we called every sponsor, every exhibitor more than once as we were making the decision. And then when we made the decision to postpone and then, um, we really wanted everyone to stick with us and, and keep be able to keep that revenue. So um, having them engaged, and then we offered a little bit of a package that was kind of their regular benefits plus some extras. And that seemed like the right thing to do, not only to encourage them to stick, but kind of the mutually beneficial, they were getting more visibility, we were getting more visibility, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships. So I encourage you to do that too, if you think about uh, uh, in addition to thanking people and letting them know how they're connected to your work, keeping them in the loop, if there's extra thank yous, extra visibility you can give when appropriate, I think, you know, now's the time to be doing that. Again, in a way that makes sense for whatever you're doing, not creating some new effort that's hard to pull off. Right. I found <laughs> at the Gale, with the Gale School, um, I have a historical website that I created from from uh, inheriting a ton of town reports. Um, I created the website so people would know about their town, or, or at least the students going to school would know something about their town. Every time they went to look for something about their town, they had no information. So I created that back in 2003, and now I have a following of over... 5,000 people, and I found that when we put out, um, I'll put out a little thing, we had to send your donation. People are very happy. Not everybody is user friendly with the internet or even feel safe on it. So, you know, just throwing out there, we had to mail a payment or a donation to the Gale School. We've received a lot of funds that way. And we've also done videos on um, GoFundMe and things like that and kept it have kept it updated and we've received a lot of funds that way as well so those are things you can utilize when we're in these times yep. um, if you have a huge following um just a suggestion so, so can i ask a question then you, you mentioned and then, and then Lori. yeah okay oh oh i'm sorry no no go ahead i'm sorry no she go ahead phil i just wondering what your success rate in terms of percentage maybe of dollars that came in through GoFundMe was we tried it and it kind of just flopped. Um, I would have to do that with the treasurer, but we started as far as the percentage. Um, but we did, we went all out. We did a video of the building in detail. Um, and you're certainly okay. welcome to go to the GoFundMe page and look at that. It's uh, save our Gale school. Um, look at the video and all the things we've put in there. Um, I don't know what our actual percentage is, but it, it's done us a world of good. And our, our accountant, our treasurer will send out thank you cards to even the people that donate there, um, mm -hmm. as well as the ones she receives in the mail. 
and the information the bank collects for us because some people just prefer to go through the drive through and drop off a check uh, okay. or mail it <laughs> for that. So Beth, uh, do you want to react to that? And then we should... Um, well, and then Lori had a question. And Lori, yeah. Do you want to react to the GoFundMe at all? So GoFundMe, in my opinion, is good for the very end of a campaign. And GoFundMe's are usually best for um, short-term, very specific yeah. needs. So yeah. if you're at the end of the campaign or if you need a, you know, to fix the front steps or um, I did work with the Shakorawa Lake, uh, how can I forget their name? Yeah. yeah. Um, and somebody drove through their iconic rails on that bridge up there and mm -hmm. they did a GoFundMe for that and that was effective. But it has to be discreet, yeah, short term so and not not a huge amount of money generally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Thank Lori, Phil, and then George, let's do that order to, as we wrap up. So briefly, uh, I serve on three different historic resource boards. And one of the questions I have, is there any thought about having a sort of a New Hampshire Gibbs style campaign just for historic resources? So that, and it's, it's uh, as we all know, dealing with boards, they tend to put their own emotions before reality. So they're all worried about, we shouldn't be fundraising during this environment when medical masks are more important than, you know, null posts. But the reality is there are people out there who will give because of that positive message of a historical resource. But I do think, <laughs> yeah, I do think historical resources are perhaps less skilled in this area of fundraising and could use a unified fundraising campaign. Has any thought been given to that? Um, a little bit is my short answer, but I, I'm glad you brought it up. It's a good thing to, to talk through. I happen to agree with her. Uh, it seems when I am out there looking for resources, there's not many yeah. out there. Yeah. So we need and to we're at the end of our project. We are moving the building in August and we're building the road right now and we're like thirty thousand shy of what we need. Um That's so amazing. Kinda yeah. And we've been at it for twenty five years, so don't oh. give up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, we often use the environmental movement as a, um, you know, kind of a big sister. They're, they're uh, 20 or 60 years ahead of us, depending on how you count it, and how can we um, uh, expand the, you know, not only the constituent base, but the donor base um, to get close to what they're generating in terms of uh, the millions uh, every year for conservation. You know, it's, a, it's such a interwoven um, theme and uh, activity in New Hampshire, we should, we should be able to get there. So was it Phil and then George? Am I counting this right? Phil, you have something probably need no, to- No, no, I, I, I interrupted Lori, I apologize. So did you have something else? I think Lori's ready. No. Lori, no. And Lori already spoke, so. I'm good. Okay. George, do you want to say a little something about just the LCHIP, um, what you're looking for, what the deadlines are, what's different, and then, you know, anything else you want to weigh in on? Thanks for joining us today. Sure, my pleasure. So the New Hampshire Land and Community Heritage Investment Program provides matching grants for historic preservation projects as well as for land conservation. About a third of the people I'm looking at on the screen <laughs> I know because they're involved in LCHIP projects, so uh, I'm going to focus on those people I don't recognize um, for the time being. Um, we have a two-part application process, which is um, consists of an intent to apply form first, which is due on May 15th, and a final application, which is due at 12 noon on June 26th. Uh, we are trying to meet this challenging moment in a way that, um, you know, we hope will be effective and, and helpful. Um, we did an informal survey of some of the prospective applicants that we were aware of um, and the, of the people who replied, most everybody said, 
we are planning to meet your deadlines. Don't cancel your grant round. Don't you know, don't mess things up. We we want to go forward. Um, we ourselves are trying to frame our work in terms of employment um, and um, economic stimulus. Uh, so projects that can launch um, by next year are certainly uh, especially valuable. Um, we are a matching grant program. I was delighted to hear Betsy say that, was it 86% of giving comes from individuals? 82 to 85%. Okay, 82 to 85. Well, so we, we require a 50% match. Uh, and that sounds, by, by those numbers, like it's perfectly doable, although we know full well that a lot of people still No, don't. it's, yeah, it's hard. Um, but it's nice to know that we are not the only source of money. There's a good source of, of private funding out there. Yeah. Um, we fund projects to uh, do historic rehabilitations as well as planning studies. Um, the planning studies are a really good uh, way to begin, if, if especially if you have a complicated project with lots of moving parts. Um, if you are going to be eventually coming to LCHIP for a project that is going to cost more, more than $50,000, then you need to have a planning study anyway. Um, and the Preservation Alliance also funds planning studies. So. Um, Jennifer, Betsy, uh, or um, Beverly, and I are happy to field call inquiries about planning studies anytime. Um, what else? Eligible entities. We fund uh, 501c nonprofits as well as public entities, political subdivisions of the state of New Hampshire, cities, towns, school boards, that sort of thing. Um, work needs to comply with the Secretary of the Interior standards for historic preservation. Um, that's part of what makes a project eligible. Um, you do not need to have your match in hand to apply for funding. You just need to have your match in hand before you begin work. So, um, and sometimes we fund mm -hmm. projects that, um, and, and the, uh, Kimball Jenkins is an example of this, where we, we gave a grant at the beginning of the, of the fundraising and um, they've spent the last year diligently fundraising. And, and it's great to hear Althea talking about you know, pulling the trigger on on the work um, soon. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Anybody have questions for George about LCHIP or anything else? Sorry, George, you were going to say one other thing, I think. Sorry. Go ahead. I have a thank you for George <laughs> because I, I believe um, the Swansea, the town of Swansea, had some money through LCHIP or one of the grant um, funding organizations that help pay for a planning study that I hope will be coming to New Hampshire um, Preservation Alliance soon. We're trying to save the Goldenrod Grange mm. on Route 32 in Swansea. It's right in Swansea yeah. Center. It suffered several years of neglect, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> and we finally have the interest of the town shown through getting it on the warrant articles and the article passed that the town put some money into the, the Grange Hall to at least stabilize it so we can work further on saving it and refurbishing it a bit. Great. Good, that's great. I believe that was a, a planning study that the Preservation Alliance uh, funded. That is we, correct. Yep. We fund the LCHIP funds the, uh, provides a block grant to help the Preservation Alliance. Okay, that's right. It was New Hampshire. Okay, I get a mixed up. I'm trying to work with a group that had worked on that building back in the 90s, and it's it's been really hard to get all the cogs to fit into the wheel right, because you, I, you probably run into this. You have these over here and those over there, and they don't always mesh. <laughs> so the building does belong to the town, but I think it's vitally important to the community that that building be refurbished and, and manages to stand there for another 100 plus years. Mm -hmm. Well, vitally important to the community. Maybe that's a good way to end. Is that okay? Absolutely. People ready to sign off? I, I wanted to um, thank Betsy so much for her prep and making herself available. Um, she's fabulous at what she does and you're really generous and nice to do this with us today. Thank welcome. You, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great to see you all and meet you all. We're gonna. Good to see you again.
We're going to send a follow up that has some nice resources that um, Betsy made available to us. Do you want to say anything about those, Betsy? Yeah, there, there, one is a link to that chart or that graph that I referenced about um, where money comes from and where it goes. And the other is uh, there are two links to two different articles that I've seen that I find helpful about fundraising during COVID-19. So, and it might not be specific to small community-based organizations, but the concepts are the same. Yeah, that's great. And we have a couple links we'll add to that and make that available as a follow-up. <coughs> We also have an evaluation, takes one or two minutes to fill out. Please do that to help us um, shape what we're doing in future programs. Um, I mean, I, we've, we've talked about it during this session, but I think um, the work that uh, the Preservation Alliance and all of you do is really, really important. Uh, the good news that Betsy keeps referencing and so important to the kind of long-term health of our communities and um, helping with economic issues short and long term. So um, thank you for all you do. Thanks for being on this call and um, keep up the great work and please stay healthy. Yeah. Thanks Good. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for organizing. Yep. Good, Good to see meeting. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.